Talktainment Radio Worldwide Sound. Talktainmentradio.com. We give you a reason to come. The world's greatest radio. We give you a reason to stay. Radio, the way it should be heard. You got the power. The views and opinions expressed are those of the host and guest and not necessarily those of TalkTainmentRadio.com, the management, the staff, or KE World Network, LLC. This is the Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio, radio the way it should be heard. And now, Mr. Neely Fuller. If you do not understand white supremacy, which is racism, what it is and how it works, everything else that you understand will only confuse you, only confuse you, only confuse you. Good morning. And uh, welcome to TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. And you are in touch with the compensatory concept with Neely Fuller, Jr. I'm Mr. Bobby, the show's co-host. And this is radio the way it should be heard. We are emanating live from Columbus, Ohio, where it is cold outside, 10 degrees. I don't know where you are at, but most of the country, at least according to the Sources that I have, at least 50% of the country is covered in snow and the cold, going all the way down into Texas and out west and, of course, out east. It's it's cold. But nevertheless, this show is not cold. This show is hot. And on the line from Washington, D.C., the so-called nation's capital of the so-called United States of America, is uh, Mr. Neely Fuller. Good morning, Mr. Fuller, and how are you? I'm still learning. You are still learning. What are you still learning? I'm still learning about everything that I don't know. Okay. Uh, Because there are a lot of things that need to be known, that should be known, in order to accomplish what should be accomplished. Yes, sir. uh, I have to be in the process of learning Mm -hmm. all of those things, because there's so much to be done. It hasn't been done, mm-hmm. and when I came into the world, it was that way, and I've been here a little while, uh, and all during that period, I keep hearing about things that are left to be done, mm-hmm. so I've also uh, taken the position, based on logic, that I'm supposed to be to do, doing the things that should be done. Okay. I'm supposed to be helping as best I possibly can. Okay. And with that in mind, uh, let me ask you this. Um, according to whatever news that you have uh, that's perhaps going on in the world, or maybe something that you feel that we should know or understand and how it works, uh, what would that be? Well, First of all, you look. I, I say that we all put here. Uh, this is just an assumption. I think it's a logical assumption because logic came with the universe. People are supposed to use it, meaning figuring out the cause and effect of things and what is constructive and what is non-constructive. I think that's what all of the people on the planet uh, are assigned to do while they are here. Because there are things to be done, and we're given tools to do it with. We're given a brain, we're given fingers and fingernails, legs and arms, eyes, ears. So I would look at this assortment of equipment and come to the conclusion, logically, that you're supposed to do things with all of this equipment. This is some pretty first-class equipment that most people are given. Some people are born with defects, maybe with one arm or something like that. But the fact that they have an arm means that that arm is supposed to be used to accomplish something. And that brain and uh, the eyes and ears, so accomplish what? Well, the things that need to be accomplished that are around them, around each person, people. Uh, these creatures who are called people. So what are these things? Well, solving problems. So I look at the world that way, and starting with about the middle of the last century, I came to the conclusion that 
What problems? Well, there are all kinds of problems to be solved right in front of you every day. Everybody is trying to solve a problem, even if the problem is just trying to catch the next bus because they missed the last one and they're going to be late for work. And so that's a problem. And they have to think about how they're going to explain what happened because of the weather or whatever. And so somebody's going through a problem right now. Most people uh, have furrows in their brow about problems that they're trying to solve. So it's all about solving problems. I came to the conclusion that the biggest problem among the people of this planet is the lack of justice, meaning balance between people, meaning guaranteeing that people are not mistreated and guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help. That's a compensatory definition since this this program is about the compensatory concept. Uh, Compensatory means making up for what's missing, and what's missing is justice. And there was even uh, the lack of a comprehensive Mm -hmm. or a clear definition of Mm -hmm. the word justice. Mm -hmm. So I made up one. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I said that justice consists of two parts, and that is guaranteeing that no person is mistreated, part one. Part two, guaranteeing that Mm -hmm. the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help. And I say that this is what we are supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that in a world that's dominated by racism. Mm -hmm. I came to that conclusion. That's the biggest stumbling block right now on the planet. So if somebody disagrees with that, which which would be their prerogative, but as you stated, this is what you came to, Neely Fuller came to. This is Neely Fuller's conclusion. Am I correct on that? That's correct. And yes, people sir. People should, if if they see a reason to disagree with that, uh, then I should welcome their disagreement mm-hmm. because I'm in the process of learning. I started off saying I'm still oh. learning. Mm-hmm. So you did. Says, yes. Oh no, racism is not the biggest problem, and the lack of justice is not the biggest problem. Uh, there are other problems, mm-hmm. so I want to know what those problems are. And whatever those problems are, I'm going to assume that if someone makes a statement like that, you would be interested in the data that would provide or that has provided them with that uh, conclusion. Is that correct? Sure, because everybody on the planet, we're in the universe, and we're supposed to figure out what it is that we're supposed to be right. doing. Yes, sir. It all comes down to what we're doing here. Maybe people will say we're not even supposed to be solving problems. We're supposed to be doing something else. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to know what the something else is and what the procedure is for exactly for, for doing so. Which, I mean, uh, how do I use my brain? How right. do I use my fingernails? Uh, all of this. Which is why in the statement you made, it is important that you understand what the it is and how the it works. Is, would that be correct? Sure. Yes. Okay. And and everybody should be welcome to the table okay. to do that. Okay. And then the conclusions from whatever the findings are, in particular, you know, your findings or my findings, it's either going to be constructive or non-constructive. Would that be correct? In my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yes, in your opinion, and, and yes. They, and, and my opinion is based on what I consider to be logic. Right, right. Cause and effect. In other words, uh, is something going to be Constructive or non-constructive? Yes. Uh, th- these are the two categories. There's nothing in between. Yes. And again, this was according to your information, your data, and your opinion. Yes. Okay. I, there we go. Okay. We want to get, get that that's straight. That's why I call it the United Independent Concept, which is what my base, that's part of the title of my book. Yes. Yes, exactly. Okay. With that in mind, listen to the callers. Since we went into a detailed explanation because we want to get everything straight, if you would like to get in contact with Mr. Fuller and the show, you may do so by calling 1-877-932-9766, and Mr. Fuller would be happy to uh, discuss or give his opinion on whatever your uh, questions are. And speaking about that, we do have a question here. Let me see. If I can get this, this comes from Brother Mao. He says, I hate having to ask or discuss a mainstream issue, but since it's been a major story for the past month, and it is an issue of interest and concern to many black people stateside, I'd like to ask, 
how you think we should analyze the uh, the man himself and the allegations against him in the context of your book or under uh, the system of white supremacy. Uh, him being, um, I believe it was uh, uh, Michael Brown and uh, the officer Wilson in the Ferguson, Missouri action. Well, within that context, uh, we're all in the system of white supremacy, so Mr. Wilson, who is the officer, is suspected of uh, committing a racist act by killing Mr. Brown, and that might be valid. Uh, So the details about that are still uh, somewhat controversial. Uh, What person did what? Mr. Wilson, simply by being a white person in the system of white supremacy, first of all, would be a racist suspect anyway, according to counter-racist logic. If you're a white person and you're able to be a racist, there's probable cause to believe or to suspect that you probably are one, simply because you're born in the system of white supremacy itself. Mm -hmm. And the system of white supremacy teaches white people that, they have a duty, actually a duty, to dominate and mistreat people who have color in their skin. Now, it's unfortunate that it's that way, but that is the world philosophy. Mm-hmm. If a person has color in his or her skin, black, brown, red, yellow, tan, beige, anything except white, then that person is eligible eligible by birth and by existence to be mistreated by anyone who is classified as white. Mm -hmm. That is the philosophy of white supremacy that dominates all of the people on the planet. Okay, then what does it teach black people or people of color? So it teaches black people to suspect that any white person is subject to do them harm. Okay. Any white person who is, let me correct that, any white person who is able, see, little babies that are just born are not able because they don't know the difference between one color and another, Mm -hmm. uh, logically speaking. So you have to know your colors in order to be a racist. Okay, now. You have to be able to recognize blue from green. Okay. So, So in that situation that you just described, if a black person marries a white person, uh, which, according to you, should should be a no-no, should the black person expect that they're going to be mistreated racially? Well, the, white per- the black person in the system of white supremacy, according to counter-racist logic, the black person in that so-called arrangement, or you might say relationship, really mm-hmm. it's an arrangement, okay. the black person is automatically being taken advantage of mm-hmm. because they're in, that black person is in the position of a child. See, we are illegitimate children. If you're classified as black and you're on this planet in the system of white supremacy, Mm -hmm. you are in a childlike position. Mm -hmm. So anyone who is white that has sexual intercourse with you, that person is automatically taking advantage of you and is a child abuser. Wow. Regardless of the emotions that are involved. Mm -hmm. Now, a white person might say that Oh, no, I love the person. That's why I married the person, and I take care of the person, and I look out for the person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not personal. It's business. It's the system of white supremacy itself that says, yes, but in your capacity of having sexual intercourse with a person who is in a weak position because of color worldwide, you become in a position of a child abuser. You're having sexual intercourse with a child, even if you say you love the child. The child has no power. You have power as a white person that that child does not have. So therefore, you're in that position. You're also in the position of a warden going into the cell and having sexual intercourse with the prisoner. Wow. It's not personal. Mm-hmm. It's business. Mm-hmm. It's the power relationship. The mm. person that you have in sexual intercourse, the person of color, has no power compared to what? Compared to the power of the awesome system of racism that says this person 
is an inferior person. This person is a person who is designed to be mistreated by people who do not have color. Right. People who are classified as white. Okay, designed. Okay, you're listening to The Compensatory Concept on TalkTainmentRadio.com. Radio the way it should be heard. Uh, Let's go to the phone lines. Okay, caller, you are on with Mr. Fuller. What is your question for Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr.? Uh, peace and good morning. Uh, can morning. I be heard? Yes, you're, you're on. Good. Uh, my name is Shaw Peace. I'm calling from Richmond, Virginia. I have one question. Wait a minute. Wh- Mr. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, Virginia. Okay, go yes. ahead. I have one question for Mr. Fuller, and I have one comment for you. Actually, one suggestion for you. Okay. Or request. Uh, my, my question for Mr. Fuller is, you speak about a sergeant who taught you uh, about how to um, logically think. What, what was that sergeant's name? Well, I'm not sure that he would want me to give his name. He was a black sergeant in 1957 uh, in a place called Wajima, Japan, which is where I was. I was on a radar site at that time, what we called the Air Force. And uh, it was what you call a hardship post, and we were stuck up there in the mountains in uh, Japan uh, facing the Korean and the Russian borders uh, across the water there. Now... And this sergeant uh, uh, said to me one day, he said, Well, I've been watching you because I'm making my business to study people and figure them out, and I've got you figured out. You're one of these people who are running all over the world looking for an ideal situation. Hmm. And he says, Let me tell you something. There's no such thing as an ideal situation. There are some downsides to everything. Now, if you want this paradise that you're looking for, if you want this ideal situation, you're going to have to produce it. You might as well just stop running. And that was a lesson to me because he could see through me. And he came to that conclusion. He says, you're just going from place to place, running away from things. I can tell that. And you got to stop and turn around and start handling situations that you're in. And I, I considered myself to be a person like that. However, I never told anyone that, but that's exactly what I was doing. I was looking for Shangri-La, and that's the person who taught me to start thinking logically and start thinking in terms of thinking along the lines without even saying so or going into detail. He didn't do that. But I started thinking about myself, and then I came to the conclusion you can't run away from problems mm-hmm. that you're supposed to be solving. That's why you have the problems. Fuller, wake up, smell the coffee. You have the problems that you're supposed to be solving. And the more you try to run away from them, the more you're going to trip on your own shoelaces, which is what I was doing. I was just going crazier and crazier, really, literally. And I think that's happening to a lot of people. And when I start thinking like that, I start observing other people. Mm-hmm. And I saw a lot of people actually trying to do that Mm -hmm. with drugs, with alcohol and whatnot, just running away, running away. I I can't handle it. I can't handle it. This world is too complicated. I'm going to get drunk. I'm going to get drunk. I'm going to get high. I'm going to uh, do this and do that. I'm just going to run around in a circle and bump into things Mm -hmm. and hope that everything works out. Wow. uh, I wasn't, you know, on alcohol or drugs or anything like that. But I was doing that running. That's how I wound up in Japan. Mm -hmm. I joined the Air Force after having been discharged from the Army. But Mm. I figured I could get away from things. Maybe they would send me somewhere where, well, you know, I can uh, find paradise. I can find Oz. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so that's the long answer to that question. Okay. Before you give me your suggestion, caller, let me go back to something um, uh, Mr. Fuller said. Uh, you just said that you were on a uh, hardship post. Well, somebody just texted me, said that what is a what is a hardship post and how does that work? Well, it meant that you're kind of in isolation. It was a radar site, so it was in a small Japanese village, and we were restricted there, and there was nothing to do for the most part but just count the days when you were going to get out of there, almost like being in jail. Did you do something wrong to to get that assignment? No. 
it was just an assignment that they considered a hardship post because it's isolated out in the woods and way up on top of a mountain. Oh, okay. And you were going to be there for a year. Wow. And so usually an assignment overseas at that time meant from two to three years, mm-hmm. depending on what your enlistment was. Oh, okay. So they said, no, but this post is going to be a year because at about that time, you know, the normal average person is going to be so bored out of their school that they're going to need some relief. Oh, okay. So All we right. will cut it from two years to one year. All righty. <laughs> Okay, uh, caller, you said you had a suggestion. I got my pen ready. Go ahead. Actually, it's more of a request. Okay. Um, uh, you know, I know Mr. Fuller, um, he only has an hour of a show uh, every Wednesday, and mm-hmm. I know he's in his 80s, and, you know, um, I, I was going to request that, um, you know, we, we, we uh, take a little less callers and hear a lot more of Mr. Fuller. I mean, even if it does take a, a little while for him to explain, I like mm-hmm. to hear every word he has to say because I don't know how long I'm going to be able to hear him. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Uh I, I can't say that's a, a, a very good suggestion because Mr. Fuller is here to help and he does like to field uh, calls and the people do have concerns about that. But I tell you what we will do, we will take that under consideration and, um, you know, see what happens on that. But we do thank you for your call and, and thank you for your suggestion also. Oh, thank you. Yes, sir. I okay. Uh-huh. All right. Have a great day. You too. Right. Okay. So, Okay. I know you love the field call, so we'll see what we can do about that. Um, now, according to the, the – speaking about that, let, let, let's go to your book. Um, you mentioned a little bit about your book in the uh, in the opening, but uh, discuss the title of your book, break it down, and then, most importantly, uh, how one can get a copy of your book. Because I'm, I'm asked that question all the time. Oh, they can go to ProduceJustice.com. Just those two words, Produce Justice, and then add the dot .com. And then up on the screen will come the basic book, which is called the United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept. Uh, but that doesn't tell a person anything by the title. And then there's a, an additional book, which is a word guide. But both of these books are about racism and how an individual person can deal with it on a day-to-day basis. I address everything to individuals. Now, people who are members of organizations, I mean, can use it and all like that. But it's not addressed to organizations per se or even telling people to join organizations or not join organizations. It's telling people what to do in every circumstance that you're in or given some type of guidance, every circumstance that you're in, in all of the areas of activity, mm-hmm. economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. And each individual person is engaged in one or more of those activities at any given time. So it's addressed to the individual non-white person the person who perceives himself or herself to be a victim of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. So the subtitle of of the book is Textbook, Workbook, or Thought, Speech, and or Action for Victims of White Supremacy. Now, some people have said to me on the air and other places, well, I don't don't see myself as a victim of Mm -hmm. white supremacy. Mm -hmm. I'm not a victim. I'm black, but, but I'm not a victim of white supremacy. Well, then it doesn't apply to that person. If you don't perceive yourself as being a victim, if you don't perceive yourself as having any problem with racism, that everything is just fine with you, then nothing in the book applies to you as that person. Yes. It's addressed to people who perceive themselves as being under the system of white supremacy. Okay. So produce justice. Produce justice. Go to that. And then it will tell you how to order the books. Okay. All righty. Uh, let's see. I do have a question. Uh, wait a minute. Let me get it up here. Uh, this is, if I can get it on the screen here, this is coming from Trent in Chicago, one of our loyal listeners. And this is his question. Mr. Fuller, how do we teach our children to deal with hidden racism? You teach them mostly as a ask questions, and also you start with the uh, premise that you yourself are a child. 
So people sometimes ask me, what do you tell young people? I say, you tell young people the same thing you tell old people. You tell them the truth. Hmm. And the best time to tell them is when they ask questions, just like with old people. Mm -hmm. Somebody asks you where the bus stop is or where the train station is or what the weather's going to be tomorrow. And if they know or think that they know, they give you the answer. And because people are more receptive to what you have to say when they ask you a question. And young people ask all kinds of questions. But black people have been taught systematically to shut people down when they ask questions. Because black people are taught by the white supremacists not to ask questions. Mm -hmm. I, was just getting ready to, I was just getting ready to ask you that. Why? Say, 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 re, could you repeat that again? Black people have been what? Taught by the... The white supremacists taught black... One of the first things they taught black people when they put them in chains is let them know. You don't ask questions. I ask you questions, but you don't ask me anything. Mm. You just do what I tell you to do. So black people grew up with that in mind, and they passed it on from generation to generation. Shut up, boy. You ask too many questions. You know what? You're right, because I remember coming up as a kid, if I were asked a question to my parents, a lot of times it was said, because I said so. And that was the end of it, you know. So you, yeah, okay, I can, I can go along with that. Wow. Yes, and the white supremacists spread that among their victims. Wow. Big time. I mean, that became a mantra. In other words, a slave that asks questions is dangerous. Hmm. <laughs> wow. Hmm. Don't even ask Raymond. Okay. Um, that's a little inside joke, Raymond. Richard Pryor. Uh, <laughs> Let's go to the lines. Go ahead, caller. You are on with Mr. Fuller. What is your question for Mr. Fuller, caller? Go ahead. Well, uh, I would like to piggyback on what the caller who just got off said. If, if you know, if you could have Mr. Fuller talk for at least the first thirty minutes, and the rest of them, uh, the time is a question and answer because he's a great truth teller, and generally when he just talks. I get so much out of what he says. Some of the things that he's saying, I mean, I hadn't thought of. Okay. And, and and here's the other thing. Uh, for a while, I had a problem with the philosophy that all white people were not racist. And now he explained that this morning with babies and children, because I work with children every day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And those children, white, Asian, black kids, and I, you know, it's so beautiful with them because they haven't gotten this concept of racism. But I know that later on, these white kids and the Asian kids that are growing up, they're going to have this, uh, uh, you know, this, this philosophy that mm -hmm. they take on from society. Okay. So if he can expound on that a little bit more about, you know, these white people who are, who are able, and most of them who are past, I say in their teens are mm -hmm. able uh, if he can just go into more detail. Okay, wait a minute. Before I ask him that, since he's on the line, yes. why don't you ask him if he if he would speak for okay. thirty minutes? You know, go ahead, ask him. Okay, I'm sorry. I I don't thought go I was. It's, it's all right. Go ahead. Well, can you expound on that a little bit more about those uh, uh, whites who are able to practice racism, white supremacy, and those who are not, because I, I tell you, I get it from the older group every day. They got to be in charge of me in some kind of way. And the little ones are more respectful and, you know, it's, uh -huh. yeah. Okay, I'll I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take a little short break. And, I'm, and, 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 and I'll mute my line. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, and then Mr. Fuller, you'll answer the question on the other end. Uh, talk to him at radio.com. Check us out on WCRS-FM 98.3, Wednesday and Sunday evenings. Blogs and podcasts are available. Download Talk to him at radio.com app to your cell or tablet. We go where you go. Radio, the way it should be heard. Mr. Fuller will answer the questions next on talk to him at radio.com. TalkTainmentRadio.com is the premier internet radio platform offering 40 plus talk radio style programs professionally produced, optimized for online distribution, featuring Columbus, Ohio on-air personalities. 
TalkTimeRadio.com offers listeners diverse programming options covering topics such as arts and culture, love, life, and relationships, technology, religion, paranormal activities, local and national politics, women's issues, alongside health and wellness. Listeners can access their favorite TalkTimeRadio.com programs free of cost through the website. Download the TTR app to your cell phone and you can take us wherever you go. We have programs on demand to fit your schedule through our podcast. The address is TalkTainmentRadio.com. In the small town of Elmira, New York, a boy was born into an all-American family. The odds of him opening his own clothing store at the age of 18? 1 in 138,000. Excited to be a part of pop culture, he packed for the big city. The odds of him achieving his dream in the fashion industry? 1 in 23 million. The odds of having a child diagnosed with autism? 1 in 68. I am Tommy Hilfiger, and my family is affected by autism. I encourage you to learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Early diagnosis can make a lifetime of difference. Brought to you by Autism Speaks, the Ad Council, and TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. Goodwill is a global social services enterprise and the leading nonprofit provider of job training programs and career services in the United States and Canada. To pay for its program, Goodwill sells donated clothes and other household items in more than 2,700 stores and online at shopgoodwill.com. Goodwill uses the revenue earned from these sales to fund job training, employment placement services, and other community programs. The goal of the campaign is to increase goods donations to Goodwill, inspire an emotional connection to the Goodwill brand, and to elevate preference for Goodwill. Will. Supporting minority education. I'm Sean Booker, damn it, from The Melting Pot. I'm here to tell you that as the mother of a high school senior, I know due to financial circumstances, many of America's deserving minority students do not have access to a college education. Since 1944, the United Negro College Fund has sought to provide one. Since 1972, the beginning of this campaign, UNCF has helped more than 300,000 talented students earn a college degree. I'm Sean Booker, damn it, give a helping hand. The United Independent Compensatory Code System concept by Neely Fuller is considered as one of the substantial and basic books for understanding and effectively countering racism. Neely Fuller will turn upside down everything you've heard and everything you think you know about racism and how it works. Call area code 202 484 5461. 202 484 5461. I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not gonna take this anymore! Go ahead. Make my day. You got the power! Alrighty, welcome back to a second slice of the action. I have a smile on my face because a lot of people, uh, Mr. Fuller, want to hear more of you. But get, I mean, uh, want you to speak more. But guess what? The phone lines are completely lit up. So we'll see about that. Uh, okay. Um, this lady had asked a question about you speaking for the first 30 minutes. The first caller indicated that they want you to speak more. Uh, wh- what are your feelings about that? Oh, uh, I am open to both. Uh, during the years that I've been doing this on different radio programs and uh, even in seminars, uh, uh, people say, well, I don't get a chance to have all the questions answered. That's because there are millions of questions. And so even in presenting the material, I have found that the question and answer format at least gets some, gives me some forum for doing so, and sometimes... As you see, like on this program, I will extend, a person will ask me a question, and I will give a very, very, very long answer that will go into maybe five or six things Mm -hmm. that weren't directly associated, but indirectly associated with the original question that was asked. Yes. Sometimes I even lose my train of thought (laughs) of what I started with. Yes. You probably have recognized that. Yes. Because everything is connected with everything else. Okay. Like economics is connected with religion. Religion is connected with politics. And this is the way the world is. So I start talking about how you conduct yourself as an individual in all these different areas of activity and 
you'll start off maybe talking about religion and wind up talking about sex. Right. Uh, you know, because they blend into each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so this is just the way it works. Okay. So you just try to squeeze whatever information you can out of whatever I'm able to put out here. Uh-huh. And, uh, and I always tell people anything that doesn't make sense, you definitely want to find out, you know, something about that. Mm-hmm. Anything that I say. Because we're not supposed to go down the road of something that that is not logical. That's right. Okay. Well, uh, there you go, caller. He, he he like he said he can take it both ways. And by the way, uh, Doctor <laughs> Mister Fuller and I do not normally talk before the show. In other words, to set up you know questions or anything. He takes the questions or even from me. He would rather have it completely uh natural just 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 let it to go with it it just works better that way okay well hopefully that answered um your question if we didn't uh caller you were on line one you can call back so we can get um the gist of your uh your second question but as it is uh, mr fuller takes it just as it is whether you call or don't call maybe you want to listen to whatever he has to say he's flexible to take it uh, either way so there we go okay let's go to the next caller which looks like it's on line number two what is your question for uh nearly fuller by the way you are listening to the compensatory concept with nearly fuller jr go ahead and by the way if you want to call uh, you can do that by calling one eight seven seven nine three two nine seven six six. Okay, caller, go ahead. Oh, you talking to me? I am speaking with you. Oh, okay. How are you? Good, good, good. And how are you, Mister Fuller? I'm still learning. <laughs> me too. We are too. Um, my name is Abby. I'm here from St. Louis, Missouri, and um, we enjoy your show when we can listen to it. We always enjoy you. And I wanted to talk about, um, um, I think about a couple of weeks ago, you were talking about our future. And I feel that our future is at stake, at, I would say, at 99% or 100%. And some of us do not know it. <clears throat> and some of us are so ignorant to the, uh, what is that, 99% or 100% ignorant to knowing the truth. And my question is, why are we just so opposed to want to know the truth? And then when you tell the truth, no one wants to listen while they're throwing rotten tomatoes at you. And secondly, I was going to ask you to also, um, what do you think about, I haven't seen it, the movie Selma. And what do you think about uh uh these movies that are coming on uh, TV with past icons like Whitney Houston, and I think it's another movie coming out in February called The Book of Negroes that comes on BET. And thirdly, why can't they make a movie about your revolution? I mean, your really realistic revolutionaries like Nat Turner. Oh, okay, boy. You, you, you... Lee, those, those type of people. And I'll hang up, and we always enjoy your show because you talk truth. Thank, Power to the people. Thank, thank you so much. Okay, uh, Mr. Fuller, she gave you a plateful, but let's see what you can do with that. Uh, 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 correct. Uh, yeah, she asked three questions, uh, and I didn't <laughs> catch the first one. But now the second one was about the movie Selma. Yes. First of all, I haven't seen it. Okay. So I can't uh, pass any judgment on that. And then she went on. The third question was about movies in general that are coming out that have to uh, do with black people. And uh, I would just say that all movies, because I've named movies down through the years myself. Mm -hmm. Principally, I've mentioned a lot of movies that are made in the 1940s that didn't even black didn't have black people in them at all. <laughs> but I talk about the lessons that you look for. And generally speaking, I just say in any movie or in any book that you read, even books of fiction, look for the things that cause you to think logically and cause you to analyze and cause you to try to think of something that's constructive that you can get out of it. And that's in anything that you see, uh, anything that you look at, any book that you read. Uh, uh, movies, books, plays, uh, performances, uh, even the sounds, the sounds of what we call music. 
always mm-hmm. think about what what do you see? What is it that you're looking at? What is it that you are listening to that causes you to think about things at a level that results in you wanting to do something? that is of constructive value. You know, and, and speaking on that line, and, and I want you to correct me if I am wrong in my conclusion. Uh, you know, you always say, and it has really resonated within my entire being, that it is important that we understand what it is, whatever the it is in our lives, and then how it works. And it took me years to really let that blend or nourishing me or whatever that German, whatever it was. But once I gravitated to that and understood it, then it helped me to understand exactly what you're saying, why those two things, if you don't do anything else, are so important because what it, at least for me, it has led me into thinking logically about something. You know, wait a minute, hold up here. What is this thing here? Okay. So after I determine what the it is, then wait a minute. Now, how does this thing work? And then I apply that to the nine areas of human activity. And it, like I said, it put me on pause. Here, wait a minute. Let me, I need to understand it so that I can make a constructive, uh, decision about whatever the it is. Uh, you, 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 your, your thoughts on that, please, sir. Yes. It's the same thing. Yes. Something is either constructive or non-constructive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And if you're looking at a movie, if you're in a the theater looking at a movie, you'll say, okay, I'm looking at this scene. What is it in this, in this scene that when I walk out of this movie that I can use in a constructive manner? Okay. That will have a constructive effect on my existence, on the existence of someone else, or a combination of both. Yes. But, or you can go the other way. What is it in this scene that's absolutely poisonous to the people sitting in this theater? And when they walk out of here, it's going to cause them to do things that are non-constructive. Mm-hmm. I've seen that type of effect, too. Yes, sir. From Absolutely. movies, from TV programs, from a lot of things. Absolutely. Just like you do in real existence. If you're in a nightclub or if you're in a, in a, on a bus stop and people are doing things, people are saying things, mm-hmm. or you're riding the bus and you hear somebody talking to someone else on the telephone, right? you ask yourself, is that a constructive conversation? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if so, what's constructive about it? You know, and, and and speaking of that, and I had just written down before the show that I would go into this, but and you probably have already explained it during some of your dissertation today, but in the area of human activity that you mentioned in the book, with ec- economics being first and education, the third is entertainment. And we are speaking about movies which would be – uh, part of the inter- entertainment, you know, again, what is it that we need to understand? And I'm just asking this, you know, so that people can, can get a clue. What is it that people should understand about entertainment and then how that entertainment works? Well, it comes down to, that's the third activity is listed yes. in the book in the category, entertainment. What is entertainment? Entertainment is anything that you enjoy. Okay. So it comes down to, what is it that you enjoy that's constructive? What is it that you enjoy that is non-constructive? Somewhere right now, somebody has a needle in their arm, and they're injecting heroin. Mm. Now, they're enjoying that. That's entertaining. So they say, but is it constructive? See, that's the term, because it's going to either be in the constructive category or the non-constructive yes. category. Yes. And a person will say, Oh, yes. I mean, you know, I mean, you don't know the feeling that that gives you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. You say, okay, well, that's the plus side. You get entertained by that heroin, heroin that you're putting in your arm. But now, is there a downside? Is there some ramifications that are not going to be very pleasant for you or for someone else? And the answer has been proven through the history of the use of that substance is that it's huge destructive sides to yes. that. Yes. The destructive sides are huge. The ramifications are huge. The person begins to 
become addicted, as they say. Mm -hmm. And and that addiction means that they lose interest in other things that Mm -hmm. should be Mm -hmm. done. You know what? You know what? I I thank you for that explanation because I'm going to tell you right now, as you say that you're still learning, you have just given me another perspective on the term or the word entertainment because the the way that I have been taught was that entertainment was something like a movie or a sports program or something like that. But when you have just brought out anything that entertains you and you use the example of Heron, I I can see the logic behind that. And See? also, you can do things. It's just a matter of, uh, that's what I try to do in my book. I try to say that the white supremacists have taught us that entertainment has to be non-constructive. Yes. And black people have bought into that big time. Okay. Cursing somebody out, I mean, you know, and, 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 and making somebody feel terrible and all yes. like that. Okay. Telling jokes about people, gossiping about people. That's very entertaining. But is it constructive? Hmm. See, the white supremacists have taught black people, say, when it comes to black entertainment, it has to be non-constructive. No, we can turn all of that inside out Hmm. and say, oh, no, our entertainment is going to be of constructive value. Yes. And when somebody comes out of a theater or comes away from a play or anything like that, they're going to they're going to just have that exhilarating feeling. Right. They're going to do something that is very constructive. Hmm. See what I mean? Yes, sir. That I, can easily I, be done. I really that can easily be done. I really do. I'm still learning. Galen has given me the sign, so here, here it is. You're listening to the compensatory concept with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. right here on TalkTeamAtRadio.com radio the way it should be heard. And if you would like to get in contact with Mr. Fuller to ask him some questions. Man, you can do that by calling one eight seven seven nine three two nine seven six six, and he'll be happy to do that. Are you happy, Galen? He's shaking his head at me. Okay, <laughs> let's uh, go to line number one. What is your question for Mister Fuller? Line number one. Go ahead. Good morning. Is good that morning. Me? Yes, it's you. Okay. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you, Mister Fuller, for helping us. Um, what I would like to just um, extend is what you're saying about the movies. Um, I find that, you know, when I talk to people that I know, or even when I'm in the public and I'm listening, everyone is stuck, not everyone, but lots of people are stuck in talking about non-reality. I mean, you can catch a comment and someone says, oh, yes, yeah, so-and-so in Hollywood did this and so character in Hollywood did that or so-and-so, so uh, it's something they're talking about, a movie, it's something they're talking about, a show. And even when I have dialogue with people, at some point they slip out of the real world. If I'm talking about, well, you know, things are going on in our black world, we need to come to some kind of solution to reflect on some kind of collective dialogue, just, just, just do something to stay in the real world. But invariably, uh, with some people, not all, they slip off into a discussion about a fantasy character or movie. And then I started thinking, I, I was trying to understand this real strong reaction in, you know, in Paris, France, when you see these locked arms of all these quote-unquote world dignitaries over these few people that got killed, and I'm not diminishing their, their lives. But in the, in, the, in the world that everyone is living in, people are constantly sh- shooting in the movies and killing in the movies and murdering on TV, and it's murder, murder all day long, and CSI file and, and this, that, and the other. Mm-hmm. And, and so I'm like, okay, so you can entertain yourself with all this murder, but the minute that 14 Caucasian people, whatever they were, get murdered in France, the whole world has to come and lock arms and walk across the street. So these the, the the not being in reality is very dangerous okay. because we see the reaction. And that's all I want to say. Oh, oh, build oh, wait on a minute. That. Okay, so that he can understand and I can understand. If you were to sum up everything you just said in a few words so that he may directly answer your question, what would, how would he, what would you ask him so he can answer your question? Um, just comment about the dangers of entertainment as he already had and how we have to okay. stay in the real Real world. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fuller? Starting with the schools, uh, when even as a little person, I uh, started 
somewhere, someone was teaching me, directly and indirectly, including in the schools, what heroes were. And heroes were usually knights in shining armor. Not doctors, not teachers, not farmers. Oh, no, not a farmer. A person who goes into the ground and uh, comes up with apricots and cucumbers and asparagus and broccoli and apples and oranges. No, they even kind of said that a farmer was something that you kind of made jokes about. But you didn't make jokes about that knight in shining armor, that person with the sword, that person who's going around whose occupation is spending full time killing people. That's the person that the lady wanted to go to. That's the person that the lady sat by the window waiting for that knight in shining armor to take her away to that castle in the sky. Now, this is a guy that carries swords. He's got a long one on one side and a short one on the other side, and he's got armor to protect him from other people who are trying to protect themselves from him trying to kill them. Now, you come up with that in your mind, and you're just six or seven years old. So late on, you're going in the stores, and all lined up in the front of the store is bloodlust, murder mystery, murder on the Orient Express, murder, 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 killing, 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 killing. So, fast forward, age 16, you got black people running all over the neighborhood, shooting in crowds of people on the bus stop. And you say, why do we act like this? Well, the white supremacist system has fed this directly, right from the storybooks, right there in the schools. Mm. And when you drop out and you don't have a job, you think about a gun. You think about a gun as being the answer to everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you go around killing people and you make fun of that. And so you have a whole world under the system of white supremacy mm -hmm. that's been indoctrinated that's a tremendous. for seeing bloodshed mm -hmm. and worshiping bloodshed. Mm -hmm. So according to the code, if, if, if I'm going to be straight about this, anyone could be a hero and not just that whatever a knight in shining armor is. Oh, yes. I mean, some, a hero should be, a, well, actually, everybody should be a hero. I right. mean, you don't single anybody out. And it's just a person that does constructive things right. every day. Yeah. So what, what, I, what I was so trying forget to... about the whole hero Right. Thing. Okay. And, and this thing of having military parades and whatnot for people, just think about it. When you land on a tarmac at an airport, when if you're supposed to be a so-called, quote, unquote, dignitary, what do they greet you with? They greet you with people with guns. That is true. That makes no sense at all. But we're been, supposed to be lined up out there are right. nurses. But we've been farmers, accustomed to that. Yes. Doctors, yes. Pe uh, bricklayers, people who are doing something constructive. Constructive. You should hide your army. It should be just a reverse. <laughs> you don't have tanks sitting out there at the airport showing people that you are ready to shoot somebody. What kind of welcome committee is that <laughs> but that's what we're taught that's what it's we're insane. taught insane under the system of white supremacy everybody has been taught methodically to be absolutely insane and to call it sanity you we've been taught that that's a very good answer i like that okay let's go to the phone lines one eight seven seven nine three two nine seven six six is the number to get in contact with mr Neely fuller jr on the compensatory concept pretty exclusively on talk team at radio.com okay line one you are on what is your question uh good afternoon mr fuller good afternoon yes sir i heard you talking about um religion the other day and uh I guess I'm going to have a follow-up question here. Here's the question, or here's the comment. No matter what religion people of color have all over the world, their God can never protect them from the God of the white supremacists. And here's, here's two examples. Uh, during the Iraq war, Afghanistan, Iraq, you're, you'll, you'll hear the Middle Eastern government, the Afghan government, they'll say, 
they'll call out America. They'll say, okay, uh, you guys missile hit hit a synagogue and it killed 25 civilians who were in there praying. So my question to that is, if these uh, civilians in Iraq were in the synagogue praying to Allah, then why didn't Allah protect uh, these civilians from uh, from the missiles of the white supremacists? Here's the second question. Back in 1963, when you had these uh, four children praying in, I think it was the 16th Street Baptist Church, where you had a, uh, probably a white fellow, white supremacist, he threw a bomb into the basement of that church and killed uh, four little girls. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure that church, the, the 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 parents of those four little girls, they were probably it was probably a Christian church. So there again, here's the question: Why didn't Jesus or whatever religion that the four little girls' parents in 16th Street Baptist Church back in 1963? Why wasn't he able to protect them from the from the white supremacists who threw that bomb into that church? And and until this very day, Mister uh, Fuller. Fifty years later, we 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 still believe that the creator of that of the universe is 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 in the, is in that okay. building. Okay, let's give Mr. Fuller a chance to answer that question in the remaining moments. Mr. Fuller, yes, yeah, a number of questions. Uh, I can't answer the question why Jesus doesn't protect people from harm and all like that. You'd have to ask that of the different people who say that they are pastors or bishops or leaders or theologians in the Christian religion. Uh, they can best explain why that is, I guess, because they are the ones who tell everybody about what Jesus is about and what Christianity is about and why, and the answers to all of these questions. I mean, in every church, and there are millions of them, I mean, so these people can provide the answers. But now, the perspective I give is that this system of white supremacy is the strongest religion on this planet. I make that flat statement. The white people who believe in white supremacy believe in white supremacy as a religion and that they are the supreme, divine, gifted people for that religion and that they, they are the authority on that religion, the religion of white supremacy. You put that in capital letters. What is a religion? It's a strong belief backed up by action. Now, that the white supremacists according to what I have seen so far, they have made their religion the strongest religion because they practice every bit of the religion of white supremacy, which means mistreating people and dominating people on the basis of color. It's the strongest religion and the strongest political system that the world has ever seen. And the reason I say this is because the evidence shows it. Other people will cut corners on their religion. I've seen plenty of that. When the white supremacists speak, the white supremacists come around and they'll say, oh, yes, you say that you're a Muslim. You say that you're a Christian. You say that you're a Jew. You say that you're a Hindu. But you, if you have color in your skin, you will do what I tell you to do, regardless of what your God is. And if you don't like it, you will have to answer to me. And I know how to put a hurting on you so you will change your tune. Wow. Well, I hope he answered your question, caller. Sorry we had to go, but, you know, when we start hearing the music and you did call kind of close, we got to do this. Anyway, TalkTameAtRadio.com, the world's greatest radio, radio the way it should be heard. You have been listening to the compensatory concept heard exclusively on TalkTameAtRadio.com with Neely Fuller, Jr. Thanks we see you next week. Compensatory concept with Mr. Neely Fuller. Heard exclusively on TalkTameAtRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. The most important question in all racial matters is why one should always ask it. Radio, the way it should be heard. You've got the power. The world's greatest radio. TalkTameAtRadio.com.